Hello and welcome to this virtual roundtable from Food Service Consultant Society International, FCSI. Today we are addressing innovation and the quick service restaurant, QSR, and fast casual sector. I'm Michael Jones from Progressive Content and Editorial Director of FCSI's Food Service Consultant magazine. This roundtable is kindly supported by Wellbuilt and will explore how QSR and fast casual operators have pivoted and diversified their menu offering during the past 18 months and why some of those changes are here to stay. We'll look at the role that consultants have played in that process, how ghost kitchens have boosted the sector, and whether the growth in this market will continue post-pandemic. The roundtable will focus on the innovation, best practice, and new thinking that is helping QSR food service operators to make their businesses future fit. I'm delighted to be joined by some of FCSI the America's leading consultants and the chief innovation officer of one of the food service sector's largest, most diverse equipment manufacturers. I will now ask each of them in turn to introduce themselves and just give us a quick overview of their organizations. Melanie, ladies first, can we start with you first, please? Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, my background is that of an architect and a designer of uh, food and retail uh, projects and spaces. I since uh, pivoted about four years ago into a uh, strategic planner and project manager of food and food retail spaces and teams, mainly for owners and operators, including connecting local farms and or uh, growing uh, fresh greens inside food facilities. Uh, my firm is 3.14 DC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melanie. And William, over to you, please. Yeah, Bill Bender. I'm WH Bender and Associates. I'm also a vice president for Ken Schwartz at SSA that you all know out of Tampa, Florida. And we specialize in all sectors, design, consulting, MAS, management advisory services. And we work with, with everybody and anywhere we can get a great project. We like to think of ourselves as cutting edge and lead the way in collaboration. Thank you, Michael, for inviting us. Great stuff. Thank you, Bill. And Juan? My name is Juan Martinez. I'm a principal and co-founder of Profitality Labor Guru. We are a group of industrial engineers that apply the principles of industrial engineering and ergonomics to help brands drive efficiency with the end game of, of improving unit economics. At the end of the day, uh, money talks, people walk. So you've got to make money to keep the business uh, flowing. Our background is, is very unique, in not only in that applying industrial engineering, but we focus on uh, pretty heavily on chain accounts. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you look at who our clients are, have been in the past uh, many years, uh, it's really the top 60, 65% uh, of the brands uh, that, are, uh, that are out there in terms of sales and size. So it's a pretty interesting uh, and impacting work. Great stuff. Thank you, Juan. And Jay, please. Hi, my name is Jay Bandy. I'm president of Goliath Consulting Group. At Goliath Consulting Group, we consult to a, a wide range of clients throughout the food service restaurant business. Uh, our specialty is really we don't have one. So we work with independent restaurants from brand creation through opening. We work with multi-unit independent and chain restaurants and a myriad of things, as well as work in the franchise side of the business and also manage restaurants. So uh, we pretty much cover restaurant business top to bottom. Thank you, Michael. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Jay. And Rick, please. Yeah, so I've been doing innovation pretty much all my life. I uh, started in consulting. After a long time of consulting, I was worried I'd be trapped as a consultant and went into uh, running some food service businesses with a particular interest in accelerated cooking. I uh, joined um, Wellbuilt in Otis in 2005, and the company has been through a lot of changes. We're very uh, pleased about the upcoming merger integration with Ali uh, that will really put us on the map as a pretty good sized company globally to lead um, in the innovation area. So I look forward to this panel and thanks for joining. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rick. Okay, Melanie, uh, first question to you, please. Let's wind the, the clock back a little bit. Can you describe some of the, the primary challenges, I guess, that some of your QSR or fast casual operator clients have faced this past 18 months and also discuss maybe an example or two of how some have successfully pivoted their offering uh, in order to continue to serve customers throughout that pandemic? Yeah, uh, for operators that were not set up for really a streamlined, I call it order pickup and delivery system or OPD, uh, some of them were unable to really pivot quickly into a more streamlined technology. If they weren't set up ahead of time, they had to quickly kind of jump into something that wasn't necessarily ideal. 
this was really true of, of my uh, fast casual clients, really that relied more on dine-ins and on-premise uh, dining rather than to go or pick up. Uh, the clients that were unable to produce to their, you know, really reduced um, uh, menu offering, which usually what we see in the to-go um, and, and delivery, a, a reduced menu offering, items that travel well. If they weren't able to do that, then, you know, we saw some of them close, unfortunately. Some of them pivoted into new concepts and or I did have some new clients, believe it or not, that did open up new concepts. Uh, when the pandemic hit, the um, I have a client that uh, basically uh, pre-pandemic, the sales were very low. All she did was do um, to-go uh, pot pies, and they're great pot pies, um, and that's all she did. But then when the pandemic hit, her sales actually skyrocketed because all she did really well was to go and delivery. That was her model before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, she was already ready to go. So she had a really good OPD process. Um, other areas that suffered were really uh, labor and ingredient uh, shortages. Great summary. Thank you very much, Melanie. And um, Juan, moving to you, what, what pivots have you helped consult on and implement with your operator clients? And also how has back of house or even front of house innovation played a role in order to make that possible? So if I could pick, uh, piggyback a little on what Melanie was saying, um, anything related to off-premise and digital is really what made companies uh, survive and thrive uh, during the last 18 months. If you think about it, I, I, I put them in three categories. Category number one is those that had uh, off-premise and digital before those, those concepts have thrived dramatically. I mean, you see them, you, you hear about them. They have double digit sales over and over and over again. The second category is those companies and, and food service concepts that were able to pivot, right? Pivot is one of the favorite words that came out of this, uh, this pandemic. We probably had a vocabulary about them, uh, but those that were able to pivot, they survived, right? And some even thrived. And those that did neither died, unfortunately, or still struggling. You know, their, their governments provided a little bit of support but they're still struggling. You know, some examples, one of my favorite is how uh, parking lots were redesigned to become drive-throughs for concepts that did not have drive-throughs. Uh, however, another category that, that sprung up pretty nicely was curbside, right? It, it was already in the works for some, but this thing made it happen. Whether you're in retail and restaurants, it doesn't matter. You know, curbside uh, is an area that, that came up from an innovation perspective. And that one is here to stay. I mean, you see commercials about many companies trying to optimize curbside. If you're on an inline and you don't have a drive-through, curbside could be your drive-through in yeah. some respects. So that I believe that's here to stay. And uh, and we work with a lot of companies to to thrive in, in in that area. And then the last one I would offer is just meal for families. Right. Uh, an interesting dynamic is that although traffic to drive-through may have been reduced by in terms of peak, because the average ticket is much higher, sales have gone up. Right. So even to the extent of uh, mid, uh, meal kits where you get the raw stuff and then you make it at home, all those innovations came about here uh, during, during this pandemic. Very, very interestingly. Excellent. Great answer. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Bill, uh, from your perspective, then, what examples do you have of innovative thinking that has helped QSR operators to diversify their portfolio in, in that kind of agile way that, that Melanie and Juan have just described? You know, the regulation here, I'm, I'm based in San Jose, Silicon Valley, California. So we're right in the heart of California and the regulation, this is where everything stopped dead when COVID began. Our county, Santa Clara County, so everything shut down. And what the operators had to do was kind of like what Juan said and Melanie said is like, okay, we got to have drive through because that's pretty much the only way we're going to get sales in the curbside pickup, but even fast casuals on their front of their restaurants on local communities had streets. They were able to put parklets out and tables and chairs, which really allowed them to keep serving. But one of the real problems is opening, closing, opening, closing. And it's kind of like the mask wearing where we were over that till this last weekend. <laughs> and then in Los Angeles, hey, you're back to wearing masks. So the operators are just going nuts fighting all these things. And on the innovation side, really it's being visible with sanitary practices, best operations practices to hold food, to have speed of service, 
but really it's how do we retain the staff that we have and to keep people engaged, I think is the challenges that all operators and all sectors are facing right now, uh, Michael. Let's bring Jay in here. Um, Jay, how has, has technology specifically stepped up to the plate for, for QSR and fast casual this past 18 months? How has it helped to support and enable these changes? You know, Michael, for QSRs, one of the things, if you have a Chick-fil-A in your neighborhood, tablet POS, having tablets and not being wired to the restaurant, it's made a huge impact in the QSR world to be able to go outside and do pre-orders and, you know, throw out also the rest of the industry, but definitely in the QSR world, that's, you know, that allowed people to maximize their drive through you know, tying into uh, what Juan was saying about even your casual dining restaurant to the parking lot that was enabled by Tablet POS. Another thing that, you know, there's actually, I think Amazon is doing an ad tagging McDonald's on smart menu boards. So it's using your menu boards as a point of sale as well in terms of point of sale, meaning merchandising and really focusing on the guest. And, you know, the last thing that we've been involved with a project with Lee's Famous Recipe Chicken is AI at the drive through and having AI order takers. You know, I think that technology, you've read different things in the press with McDonald's, Burger King and some of the big QSRs experimenting with that and some starting to implement AI at the drive through helps solve our current labor shortage, but also really makes the drive through much more efficient. So those are really the top three for me, Michael. Brilliant. Thank you, Jay. And um, Rick, we've heard some fantastic examples there from our consultants of, of how technology has helped here and, and, and helped to support the industry, but it can't in itself be a panacea or a kind of silver bullet, can it? So how is it, how is it uh, being able to help operators to kind of keep their head above water and adjust their offering during these challenging times? Yeah, well, it's definitely not a panacea, and we're not really out of the pandemic, right? We're still in a global pandemic. But I think to your question, uh, the te- technology is not a panacea. It's a matter of connecting into the technologies that are there to pivot and to adjust, right? And so we're in the middle of uh, six converging technologies, mega technologies that are occurring in the industry. We start with you know, 5G, cloud is pervasive, IoT. And yeah, we've got AI coming on strong because the predecessor technologies are in place. We've got augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain by the end of the decade. So it's really, the panacea is how you actually look at the convergence of these and educate yourself and connect the dots into solutions that work for you and your brand, right? And each brand is different. Now, QSR invented the drive-through. Right. Thank God for the drive through. It really helped to Juan's point. Those that already had it went faster. But QSR invented a lot of things. And so I'm very confident that there's really four things that need to continue happening around making the technology a panacea. It's just continuing to improve flexibility because nobody really knows what the future has in store. So the equipment needs to be flexible. Quality and food safety are going to continue to evolve over time with higher and higher thresholds. Time needs to be decreased in every step of the operation. And last I would say skill level, you know, labor training, it's a big deal. So how do you use these technologies to do skill in the operators? So it's a big question, Michael. I don't see it as a panacea, but I see the adoption of the technology into these businesses, the panacea. And that involves education around what these technologies are, how they work and how you apply them. A little bit to that is, you know, it's, it's a puzzle, right? Technology is a piece. And how do you yeah. integrate it with all the other, what we call operating parameters, the people, the place design, the process, right. the procedure, the menu, the technology, right? All that together is really the, the ticket, the ticket to the end. How do you integrate yeah. them? And then the whole communication and, and with the POS is an important one to be able to do, uh, to, to optimize it, the user of the, the technology. So it's exciting times, really, no doubt. Yeah, I think the biggest innovations are at the intersection of those different things, right? Mm -hmm. Food, equipment, people, technology. You've got the digital, which is accelerating all that, but it's really at the intersection of those points. And the sweet spots are going to depend on the brand and what their own competitive strategy is. Brilliant. 
Thank you, Rick. Um, Juan, staying with you for a second, why do you feel this sector is well suited to pivot? Um, Rick was talking about its, its kind of history of, of flexibility in this sector. But why is it well suited, though? Well, for one is, is the executives, right? I mean, I, I would tell you, as I look back, uh, an industry that because of the thin margins was really not made to survive a week, maybe two, it survived and then some, right? If, if you think about it. And that's because the executives, they moved on, right? And, and because of that, they, they've done so well, the industry has, has done so well. Uh, and I'm hoping that as you go into the future, that mentality is going to stay. Uh, one other piece that's really interesting this industry is very um, cooperative. I mean, here we are, right? In some respects, we could be competitors, but here we are. And we do this over and over and over again in FCSI, right? Which is it's a beauty of, of the organization. But they were able to share best practices across each other. All you had to do is look at a drive through facility, a drive through concept. So if you didn't have a drive through how did they do it? How do I apply it to me? Go find out. Go call some of your friends. This industry, you know everybody in this industry. You come in and you never leave. Uh, and they're willing to share, Right. So so to me, that those two things were, were, were important. The, the executives willingness to move, the executives willingness to talk to each other because we were all in it together. No doubt about it. We were in it together and we're coming out of it together. And to me, how that moving forward into the future is, is how is this going to stay? Right. Yeah. What if this is going to stick? And my biggest recommendation to food service concepts is, is take a continuous improvement mentality. Just just what are you doing today? How can you do it better? How does technology fit a role? And keep going. And tomorrow when you wake up, ask yourself the same question because things continue to move. Great answer. Thank you, Juan. And Bill, you, you, you've got a huge experience in this, in this sector specifically. Do you agree with that assessment? What is it about this, this particular sector that makes it able to make such kind of fast recalibrations and pivot? Well, I think Juan hit all the major points, but when you look at QSR, versus casual dining, it's really the difference in facilities. You know, when you have a casual dining brand, you have a 5,000 to 7,000 square foot facility, possibly lots of employees, lots of equipment, lots of space. QSR is much smaller, less employees and a smaller menu. So it kind of goes back to what I think Melanie mentioned earlier about, well, we can trim that menu down a little. Also, looking at how our teams can be communicated with better. So we have to be able to be leaders, but we have to keep them engaged. And when brands can keep educating, keep them involved and keep working on best practices, you know, QSR really is gonna be able to lead, I think, over other sectors. Great answer, thank you, Bill. Rick, is that your experience too, from, from kind of looking at it from the other side of the, of, of the business? Has the sector always been receptive to change, to being flexible? I mean, absolutely. I built my whole career around it, right? And so, I mean, if you go back, and I'm, I'm a student of the industry, if you go back to Ray Kroc's first engineer, you know, he invented the French fry scoop. Before that, tongs were used to put shoestring potatoes into bags and the Lazy Susan, and, and we talked about the drive through in the 80s. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, it's going to continue to lead in terms of early adoption and, um, you know, the, the next whole area of innovation is around digital, right? So these kitchens, I mentioned standard operating procedure, but they're still very much open loop. There's not a lot of variables that are measured and controlled uh, explicitly. And I think as we get to more connected appliances, smart cloud-based kitchen systems, we'll close the loop so that these kitchens become operating systems where you know, every day it works a little bit better than yesterday because it's reflecting on the learning of the data and the operation from the prior day. Excellent, thank you, Rick. Jay, um, how does QSR compare to uh, say Stadia food service or casual dining and its adoption of technology in your experience? Is it a relative early adopter as, as some of the other guys have mentioned on here already? Yeah, I think there's definitely been a transition. Uh, and again, you know, piggybacking on Rick, uh, actually spent about 10 years with McDonald's Corp. Uh, McDonald's definitely an early adopter, but now you see throughout the QSR world, counter service, fast casual, you see technology now incorporating a lot faster into operations. Uh, before, you know, I'd say a decade ago, uh, QSR was a laggard in accepting technology. Uh, I remember just barely getting the Excel spreadsheets to inventory a few years ago. 
Uh, it's been more than a few, but uh, you know, the tech on curbside is quite amazing. If you've done the deep dive into, you know, the different ways to monitor people's phones, their cars, uh, both through, you know, digital imprint of the, of the license plate, but also pinging people's phones as they're coming. So that incorporates into your POS and lets you know when to have that order ready. Melanie, uh, one, one sector that has, uh, has actually thrived during this period is, of course, ghost kitchens. Uh, do you think that particular segment would have experienced exponential growth anyway later this decade without this kind of enforced escalation? And how have you seen this market, uh, the ghost kitchen market, change in the past 18 months? Yeah, basically, since I work mainly in urban areas, um, you know, really, uh, the market for ghost kitchens had changed, um, you know, pre-pandemic due to the increase uh, labor shortages, increase in real estate prices, whether you're purchasing real estate or leasing real estate. During the pandemic, I continued to see an increase, of course, in ghost kitchens, because as we've all mentioned, the to-go and the delivery model and even the curbside in urban areas was was big, you know, they're like, well, we're going to take advantage of that. And even some of the um, urban areas that I work in, they shut off their streets, you know, their actual actual downtown streets, because people weren't going to work at office buildings anymore. So let's shut some of the streets down and let's put some outdoor dining in. So we saw kind of combinations of ghost kitchens and basically they wanted to rely more on their to-go and delivery models versus their on-premise kind of dining models. And I'm curious to see after the pandemic's done, because as was mentioned, we are still in the pandemic a bit, unfortunately, um, if, if some of these restaurants will go really down to a really lean and mean kind of ghost kitchen or a QSR with really limited to no seating. I've also worked um, with some of these QSRs that because their ingredients were really difficult to obtain, and especially those that are more plant-based and relying on greens. We I even saw some people use their uh, ghost kitchen to grow their own indoor farms. So, the, you know, they're, they're growing their own greens, they're growing their own microgreens, that kind of ups the game too, because now the menu profile is really, uh, uh, the quality and the perception is higher. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Juan, what has been your experience of the ghost kitchen market recently? And I'd also like to know, do, do you enjoy working in that side of the business? So the, the answer to your last question is definitely, and I'll try to explain what, what makes it so interesting, but you know, ghost kitchens were coming, although you couldn't see them, boom, boom, no pun intended, right? Because they're ghosts. But anyhow, along, along the way, along the way, ghost brands came to existence as well. In, in other words, brands that don't exist in brick and mortar, yet they're there, right? So some are, some are children of existing brands, like chicken concepts inside a, a full service. Others are something else. But, uh, you know, that, that's very interesting how that has evolved. You know, from a design perspective, you asked the question, do we enjoy working in, in them? And the answer is yes, because it's the dynamics are different. When you think about a restaurant that sells salads, burgers, chicken, and smoothies, let's just say that, that is the menu. Well, you want to, you, you, you could create a brand around the salads called Sally Salad. And you're making it already, right? You could create a brand around burgers, call it, Quick Burgers, by the way, all these names are mine. They've been registered, so don't <laughs> uh, you call You call a brand around chicken corn, flying, flying bird, and, and a smoothie house, right? So it's pretty, it's easier to do that. And, and I, I use that word very carefully because nothing in life is easy. But you could, out of, out of an existing uh, facility, create brands. Time will tell which ones will survive and which ones will go away, right? Which ones will stay, which ones go uh, and, and some of it has to do with marketing. If you're if you're a, a ghost brand and you don't have marketing, how do you how do you sell your brand, right? Although nowadays is marketing is just digital, many many occasions. But it's going to be interesting how this evolves as we come out of the you know new normal, whatever the heck that is, or, or whenever the heck that is. But uh, it is it is an interesting and dynamic uh, time. And how does technology facilitate all of that? Yeah. Right. Not only order entry and pay but production as well. And how does that fold into automation if you want to go to the next step of, of, uh, of innovation? Great answer. Thank you, Juan. Bill, um, Euromonitor have predicted that ghost kitchen sector is going to grow into a $1 trillion market by 2030. What opportunity do you think there is for the ghost kitchen market to continue to grow once indoor dining does come back and, and reaches full capacity again? Do you think it's going to level out or has it already carved out its own space in the sector permanently? 
I, th I think it has a space. And one of the reasons I think that is there are so many closures by independents and even some larger brands in, in all sectors. You know, you drive around my area right now and you see places that were there for 30 or 40 years and they are closed, the doors closed. So what that means is the real estate is still sitting there. Somebody's paying on it. So that's going to create opportunities, I think, to some for somebody to say, Wait a minute! I've got I've got five thousand square feet here in a closed down restaurant. What can I do to get a new brand in or multiple brands in? And that creates an opportunity for a ghost kitchen experience because they have the facility with utilities, sewer, all those things in place. Now maybe we go back and look at that operation and say, okay, let's take this five thousand square feet and divide it into four areas or four different brands that could work together, and that would be a real godsend for the for the real estate holders because of the high cost in real estate. So I think it's going to continue to grow. It might level out, but it really depends on what part of the country you're in. With the people moving to the south, east, and the and the western states, you know, you're going to see some opportunities. I think continue to grow, Michael. One factor in that as well is how people will use brands, right? Obviously, over the pandemic, everybody was off premise. That's all you had. You, you didn't have a choice. But moving forward, as, as things settle down, how will they use the brand, right? Will they want to go eat out more often, less often over lunch period? Are you working from home? Are you working in the office? I always ask somebody that, that when, they're, when I know they're in New York, how does your New York look, right? Are the streets packed again? You know, are they still, how, how, have they gone back to business as usual there? And the answer is, eh, somewhat. But, but anyhow, consumer behavior is going to dictate a lot of these things as well. It will. Thank you, Juan. Um, Rick, what are some of the specific technology considerations for a QSR-focused ghost kitchen? And how are they particular to, say, a traditional QSR kitchen? First of all, you know, when ghost kitchens first came to be, people said, well, there's nothing really special. It's really a commissary kitchen. And well, it is a commissary kitchen, but it's very different in that um, it really has to do with the integration of operating systems and the physical equipment. So to your question, you know, whether or not it's ice, beverage, re refrigeration, ovens, fryers, grills, whatever, the latest technology will always benefit in, in a ghost kitchen. But I think it was going to happen even without the pandemic because I was racking my brain you know, over the shared business model like Uber or Airbnb? How do you share assets in food service when restaurants are stationary, bricks and mortar? Well, ghost kitchens are a form of sharing. And I think it's no accident that Travis Kalanick, the prior CEO of Uber, is now running cloud because that vision of how you share those assets, how you move them around. I think ghost kitchens could become smaller and mobile. Right? So you place them, you move them to where they need to be, and then you actually distribute from there. So I could talk about each category of equipment and the technology and how that works, but I think it'd be better to go one level above that, talk about the integration of the equipment inside the ghost kitchen as an operating system. And whether or not it's a full ghost, partial ghost, large or small, I think that's going to evolve. And there's going to be a whole continuity of this a notion of shared assets mm. inside of food service because these assets are expensive. So I, I think that's really the integration of the technologies. I think the technologies around the individual unit operations in the kitchen are going to be similar, but it's how they tie together to become more flexible to support the industry needs as it evolves. To piggyback Rick, in on what you said about mobile ghost kitchens, that that has given life to. I'm, I'm sure you've all read about uh, reef kitchens, right? Yeah. And they create a concept in a truck and they put it in parking lots that they own. And if it doesn't work, the idea is I'll move it somewhere else, right? So right. it's very very interesting yeah. how ghost kitchens are now movable. To your point, yeah. that uh, it's the sky's the limit because you just keep going until until you find the right site. I remember when I was at Burger King many many years ago, and I was there for for many years. Uh, in Latin America, we used to use food trucks to find out if a site was going to be good or not. You know, back to the future when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a food truck is an early form of a ghost kitchen. But yeah. you know, I'm referring to these as smarter, connected, cloud base that benefit from all the technologies that are converging. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. Melanie, let's focus on the design for a second here. And from a front end planning and, and strategy perspective, 
What, what are the, the main design considerations for a ghost kitchen to be taken into account and how do they differ from a traditional QSR kitchen? Yeah, so I want to kind of tag a little bit onto the shared kitchen aspect because, you know, the main difference that I see is that ghost kitchens are a combination of QSR and catering kitchen and have attributes of both. So some of my clients were caterers and that's all they did. And then they moved into kind of the QSR ghost kitchen, you know, sell the public situation Mm -hmm. outside of just catering and events. So because of that, a lot of people want, again, that kind of business model flexibility, uh, resilience kind of built into their concept where, okay, if, if the uh, consumer uh, model, you know, happens to be going down, then we want event programming. So we really look at in the ghost kitchen, you, you know, disguise the limit, right? You know, you can really design any business model into your kitchen that you want, set up the processes and the equipment for it. You can go into shared situations too. You can rent out part of your ghost kitchen um, for other kind of providers. So it's really, it's really, you know, getting in there up front, looking at the programming and the planning and understanding all of the business models that you want in that location, in that space, and, and really go for it. So sometimes it goes beyond just kind of traditional uh, food service prep and cooking areas. You know, with regard to real estate and space location considerations, which is super important in the planning and strategy, ghost kitchens can be, as I mentioned before, in really lesser price real estate, industrial locations, basement locations, et cetera. Considerations though about travel time to your customer still and your customer coming to you potentially picking up um, is still key to these kind of lesser price spaces. So you may be paying kind of lesser for some of these ghost kitchen locations, but you may be paying more for your um, delivery. You may be paying more for other types of um, uh, services, uh, delivery to you, delivery to the customer, uh, delivery of goods. Um, So weighing out the pros and cons of a location is important prior to leasing or purchasing real estate. Also, some of my customers, really, they've been saying that some of their customers want want to really pick up at their location. That really gets into the transparency. And, you know, some customers, they want to see how you're making stuff. They still want to, even in a ghost kitchen. Imagine, like, if, if all you had was food delivered from a premise and you never have gone to that facility after a while, you know, we're seeing you start to lose that customer kind of loyalty. It's like, you know, we kind of want to come visit you and we want to see something, even if it's a little window that we peek into what you're doing, looking to start a ghost kitchen, still think about the location and some kind of curb appeal that you have to the customer and really, you know, offer a pickup at your location. You could have a fun little event in the parking lot. So we, we tend to see these higher price points for, for that kind of engagement, even with a ghost kitchen. Great answer. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Juan, to Melanie's point there that, you know, the sky is the limit here with ghost kitchens. Is that impacting on your design philosophy and how you're approaching uh, QSR uh, kitchen design? How are your design principles being impacted by these changes? So when you think about design principles in, in general category, the, the, the need... The, the difference is that you have to make sure that you have, uh, you deliver the need to flexibility and efficiency to drive best unit economics. That's never, that, that's never going to change. You just have to do it in a different way, but the principles are the same. When you have a, an existing resource and you're sharing, part of what you're doing is using excess capacity to deliver other brands within it. But that, you know, that is why um, you see so many brands coming up and adding other brands because the, the business piece, the P&L, the unit economics is, is different uh, because of all the fixed costs already there, many of the fixed costs. So in some respects, the biggest variable cost you have is food cost. And often the labor is already there and you're using it. It's a lot less. So therefore you flow through a profit. It's dramatically bigger. Mm-hmm. So that, that's a big piece that, that's facilitating ghost kitchens within, within existing spaces because you can make a lot more money uh, without really a big investment uh, because the equipment, most of the equipment is there. You just got to have the brand. You got to have the presence. You got to have the technology and bingo, you've got a business. 
right? It's uh, simple as that. Again, I, I have a tendency to oversimplify things, but you, you get what I mean. Great. Thank you, Juan. Jay, um, in your experience, are ghost kitchens being used as incubators for innovation by restaurant groups in order for them to roll out that technology into their bricks and mortar operations as well? Have you seen any evidence of that system working? Yes, I think, you know, as we look at uh, use of a ghost kitchen, you know, that is at the top of my list of a good use of a ghost kitchen. That would be a Casper friendly ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we we have clients currently doing that that, you know, are in our realm. Uh, you know, it's a quick way to get to market because the ghost kitchens at most you're adding equipment. You need, you know, limited inspections to get going. And then also gives you an opportunity to, you know, test if it's not necessarily pickup, at least through delivery channels to test your concept. So we definitely like that. And again, you know, before they were called ghost kitchens, they were called commercial kitchens. And we've been working with commercial kitchen operators for a dozen years of testing concepts. So, you know, it's it's definitely evolved in the in the nomenclature has changed, but the not friendly ghost, some of the things we see just kind of, you know, balance the rest of the panelists is, you know, we have people moving out of ghost kitchens uh, just because unit economics don't work for everyone. And so I think there's a rush of operators to think that ghost kitchens are a panacea, panacea for a lot of things we spoke about. But in reality, when you look at unit economics in a ghost kitchen, that again, not a dark kitchen that's in a restaurant, but a, you know, a, a commercial kitchen that you're going into to set up your operations, it's not easy. You have to make sure that you go in with a strong business plan and understand the sales you need to get out of one of those operations to be able to make money. So I just throw that out there because we're also transitioning and looking at real estate for folks in ghost kitchens right now. So uh, it's not for everyone. No, it's a great point. Thank you, Jay. Um, Rick, Jay just talked there about that transition phase. Um, how has that exponential growth in ghost kitchens spurred innovation even quicker for the R&D teams at manufacturers such as yours? And what kind of pivots of your own teams had to make in order to keep ahead of that demand? Yeah, well, the first is just we needed to internally educate ourselves on what these ghost kitchens are and where they're going. And, you know, traditionally, I don't think we've seen a perfectly working model of them yet. Right. So I think there's going to be enormous shakeout. But I think the next level is the integration of these. And so that's where a lot of the technology focus is. How do you get the equipment working together in terms of an operating system? Right. Because these kitchens are really operating systems. And if you think about what goes on in kitchens, there's so much guesswork, particularly around how much food to cook. What's the what's the demand going to be? But if you can close the loop on that and create an operating system behind this kitchen, to me, that's what's going to drive it. And what's enabling that is IoT, uh, Smart Cloud. Um, you know, when I used to work in kitchens, I benchmark all these different restaurants, same brand, similar location. One of them's good, one of them's not so good. Uh, might be the upper 80 percentile and the bottom 20 percentile. And the difference was typically the store manager. Because the store manager had a lot of tacit knowledge around how to run the good store. And so I think a ghost kitchen in the future makes that tacit knowledge explicit where it can actually uh, run through an enterprise. And so to me, it's not so much about the physical assets. And yes, they need to be shared, but it's more the knowledge that goes into running these assets and the integration. So I, I think really that's it. It's really the integration of the equipment around a bigger operating system and then recognizing that they're going to be uh, in all different sizes and shapes. Thank you, Rick. M Melanie, one final uh, question from me on Ghost Kitchens. Um, Rick there was talking about that kind of what that next level looks like and, and how we as, as an industry are harnessing this tacit knowledge. How do you think this sector is going to evolve, the Ghost Kitchen segment particularly? Well, like if you see Ghost Kitchens as a kind of laboratory of, of new ideas, because I feel like a lot of my clients that, think about kind of a ghost or a hidden kitchen. It's like this, you know, uh, behind the curtain, you know, they're able to do and create new ideas. And I think they just feel more free to do that. So they're really going through a lot of what ifs, you know, during the planning and programming, 
and um, and uh, strategic kind of thinking were like, you know, what if you could grow your own food? What if you could have better sustainable systems? What if you could have, you know, less waste? I feel like people that want to get into ghost kitchens, they, they are more innovative because they want to kind of push the limits. And obviously they want to do it quickly and they want to do it efficiently. You know, a, as I mentioned earlier, we're really starting to see indoor farming, um, outdoor farming on rooftops and greenhouses, you know, even even kind of playing around with pop-up ideas, different menu ideas. Rick had mentioned kind of shared capital costs. I think another kind of innovation is going to be in that, that kind of shared capital, shared real estate, shared labor, um, and possibly with shared labor and more efficient models, there could be higher wages and better benefits. Shared resources, you know, open source uh, technology, you know, a lot of these technologies are closed source technologies. You know, if we take from the sharing economy and tech, um, you know, apps and things like that, you know, why not share some of that um, as well? So that's kind of what I kind of predict happening a little bit more. Fantastic summary. Thank you, Melanie. Um, Bill, let's stay for a second with innovation, um, but let's look at front of house technology now for the QSR segment. How can uh, fairly new technologies such as just walkout technology, JWO, self-service kiosks, remote ordering and pickup, how can those elements help uh, clients in this sector establish a point of difference over a competitor? Well, they can, they can create a big difference. And, you know, listening to all these other experts on this call, We've talked a lot about technology and innovation. And if there's two areas that you want to scare the crap out of an operator, say menu or point of sale, because they know how much work, right, Jay? How much work goes into those decisions for technology? So when you talk about just walk out technology and you talk about implementing that, it's a big deal especially if you have a client that's still on AOL with an email, all right? <laughs> so, so these type of things I think are going to take a little time to work. If you have a large-scale company with lots of budgets, lots of resources, Amazon Web Service, they're going to do fine with it. They can put it in place. But the rest of the industry and you know, independence, obviously, it, it depends on the sophistication of the brand and how well they've put technology into place and what resources they have. You know, I look at the kiosks that uh, McDonald's rolled out just a few years ago where I used to go into a local McDonald's and they have a large kiosk and it's a flat screen panel and it's, you know, it's beautiful and it works. But right now, does anybody want to go in and touch something that might be contaminated? So that whole thing kind of just went by the wayside. We've got to think about contactless faucets, contactless technology, all these things where I think AI is going to be important. But when it gets back to the brand experience, a team member is going to have to be there to answer questions and guide people and help people. And that's going to be really a way to have people say, boy, that brand really cares about me and shows concern. And I've got somebody that's going to help me. There are opportunities, but it really depends on the brand, how sophisticated they are. Um, Juan, moving on to, uh, on to you, um, in your experience, how is, um, to, to Bill's point there, how is contactless technology also helping to stave off the labor crisis we're seeing in this sector at the moment? So, you know, I, I write a lot in the industry and I always remind people when they ask me, when's automation coming? I say automation has been with us for a long time, depending on how you define it, right? Because order taking and cash in a smartphone is automation, right? Because now your labor doesn't have to do it. Your employee doesn't have to do it. So it does reduce work content. Let's call it work content means actual, actual work to do it. It's up to the operators how they use it, right? And, and before the pandemic, people say, hey, I'm going to shave off all this with kiosk and I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm going to reinvest it back to, to business. I'll tell you what, as we come out of the pandemic with the shortage of labor, there's no need to reinvest because you just don't have enough. Right. So um, it can save it does save work content and it can help with the, with the labor crisis that we're going through. Two, two pieces of it is is cost and the availability, which is pretty, pretty severe. Thank you, Juan. Um, Jay, how are operators that you work with um, responding to contactless technology? Are they, are they aware of the options that are out there for them? Yes, I would have to say that, you know, in general, because we 
I work at different levels. So I also sit on the board of the Georgia Restaurant Association. So I, I have access to a lot of operators. And I have to say, especially in Georgia and, and specifically in Atlanta, uh, operators were very quick to adopt to, for example, QR codes for menus or bring payment uh, device where you just put your card in the device and pull it out. And here's an interesting non-tech thing that I've seen in drive through and I haven't seen as many people adapt is not handing you the food over, but using a tray to push the food under the plexiglass. Uh, Non-tech, but really a cool way to bring contactless into the drive through So those are just a few of the things that we've seen. And again, on the operator side, we, we've had no operator pushback on any of those technologies. Great answer. Thank you, Jay. Um, Rick, we've, we've touched a little bit already on artificial intelligence and automation, but how do you see those two um, technologies specifically shaping QSR in the future? Well, you know, I like what Juan said that, you know, you got to define automation and I define it as the removal of, of work, um, either physical work um, or cognitive work, you know, so it could be physical labor, moving baskets of French fries. It also can be thinking. And so I see both coming into play, but I see cognitive automation as very significant because there's cognitive overload that goes on in uh, kitchens. People have too many decisions to make. There's a lot of guesswork. So I think this whole area of AI and cognitive automation is, is very significant. And I think that, you know, it starts, I mean, on our fryers today, we have artificial intelligence to help operators figure out when to filter and how, how to filter. You can actually monitor the oil quality of the oil by monitoring all the critical variables that are going through the controller and provide the operator an indication of total polar materials without a physical sensor. Um, the fryers actually have the capability to automate the filtering, but we don't allow that to happen because we're a little afraid to you know, automatically stop filtering in the middle of the day. But with some AI, you can actually uh, provide surveillance on when is the best time to do that 10 or 15 minute filtering. So I think just remote updates to the equipment, most of this equipment needs digital information. And in order to do it remotely, it needs IoT. Uptime is really key, right? And we still don't have enough uptime in the industry. And to do that, you need predictive analytics. You gotta be able to change components before they fail. And then I think food quality is gonna continue to evolve to higher and higher standards. You know, I mentioned blockchain coming by the end of this decade. And I think through the application of AI, uh, there's gonna be complete transparency uh, around food uh, all the way back, you know, from farm to fork. I think this notion of uh, labor, uh, labor retention um, is going to be impacted by AI. Uh, the younger people want to go into tech savvy and enabled places to work. The nuts and bolts of making this work in food service is really, really hard, right? So we're engaged in a massive platform to go to common controllers across all of our brands born digital so that yes, you can actually connect them to the cloud, but there's so many things that can go wrong. I mean, it can be a loose connection. It can be a problem with the Wi-Fi in the restaurant and each customer wants to do it in a different way. So I think the industry is gonna shake out, you know, the solutions and they need to be open, right? There's a discussion around closed, closed platforms not gonna work. Open systems are gonna be the wave of the future. And our industry is one of co-opetition. Right, so we cooperate together while we compete at the same time in a very healthy way. So yeah, sorry for the long answer, but I, I think this whole idea of cognitive automation and AI, these are the biggest drivers of the industry. They directly connect to the needs of the industry, but it requires a lot of human ingenuity. Fantastic answer, Rick, thank you. Uh, Melanie, can you see any opportunity from, from some of the technologies there that, that Rick very expertly summarized, how those technologies can make it easier to be more sustainable or to cut food waste in the kind of QSR fast casual projects that you're working on? 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's so many really fun and and unique and cost cutting ways that technology can help sustainability and cut food waste. So there's a lot of great apps that can track food waste from an agriculture and farming standpoint. You know, let's use those in the QSR. Transparency and traceability is important in food systems, and I think it's going to move over to um, the QSR and, and technology is going to allow that. Um, also, um, utility usage, um, you know, utility usage in your space, you know, restaurants and uh, food service water usage is is high, you know, so why not track that through technology? Um, also, a more efficient lighting, you can use technology to turn lighting on and off when you don't need it. There's air handling systems that are more efficient, you can work with your landlords to kind of really figure that out and technology can really um, create a way to uh, schedule that for you so your staff doesn't have to do it. And, you know, some cities that I work in, as far as food waste goes, they I'm surprised that some cities don't even have a way to compost. There's also other ways to kind of uh, turn your grease into biodiesel. I know that went down during the uh, pandemic. Again, you're, there's so many ways for you as a kitchen and you as a, a QSR brand to think about your sustainability and your waste practices. Um, and there's apps from other industries that you can pull from. And I think, again, those kind of shared practices, I think, would be great um, for the industry as a whole. Brilliant. Great answer, Melanie. Thank you. Um, and as extension of that, really, Jay, we talked obviously there about kind of ethical and, and, and lifestyle choices being made here. But let's look at menu changes as well. How geared up are QSR restaurants to accommodate an increasingly plant-based menu, do you think? How can innovation support that in terms of the equipment you need in the kitchen, et cetera? Yeah, there's definitely going to be a need. We work with uh, some brands that are specific. Plant-based is their platform. And then we work with other clients that plant-based is an addition. So in the concepts that plant-based is an addition right now, there's a lot of, not a lot of demand for new equipment or new technology. However, I think that's going to evolve because my learnings, and again, from the folks that do eat plant-based, and that's their primary food source for protein, they have a whole different set of demands. They have requirements on how you prepare and how you deliver that product that QSRs are going to have to look at down the road. Excellent point. Thank you very much, Jay. Now, I'm conscious of time. So a final question, and I'd, I'd like all of the panel to answer this if possible, please. Can you tell me what you think will be the most exciting or the most pivotal type of technology or innovation for QSR or fast casual oper uh, operators in the rest of the decade? What's really going to change the game? Juan, can we start with you first, please? I, I think uh, the area of automation, robotics, and AI uh, is going to continue to grow. And, and let's let's re remember that automation doesn't have to be all, right? Flippy, Flippy, the, the or a pizza maker that makes it all. It doesn't have to be that. If if applying sauce and cheese is where the laborers most of the labor spent, just do a sauce and cheese machine because it's going to be a lot easier to apply and and to purchase. And in the area of AI, Rick brought up cognitive automation. That's a big piece because as you go through labor shortages, let's, let's keep in mind that you're also going to have some challenges with managers. And as a manager, as a list manager, you're going to have newer managers. As you have newer managers, how do you drive consistency? So we're working in an area where we apply uh, um, AI, artificial intelligence, and labor management systems. We're creating a product that can help anybody deliver the right labor in the right place at the right time regardless of your, your, your experience. And I think that's a big, big area that we got to keep in mind. How do, we, how do we manage this business better from a people perspective, uh, not only from a machine perspective? Excellent point. Thank you very much, Juan. And same question to you, please, Bill. You know, you, you look at the challenges that the industry has. Now put yourself in a single unit with a 22-year-old GM that needs to have something repaired or fixed in his restaurant. So those type of things to make it easier for educating our team members, having a great team member experience where we can onboard team members, train them, teach them, provide a culture that really allows them to excel, I think is gonna be huge. So anything that we can do, because we know that young people are adopting the digital technology. 
we have to be able to attract them, retain them, and educate them, and then help lead them through that process to make their job easier. Basic elements that we lose, it gets back to the personalization, the team member experience, the training, and, and how a brand really connects with those team members. So I think the opportunity and innovation is going to be how do we teach, engage, attract, retain, and, and motivate these team members to be great professionals in our industry. And hopefully FCSI members can keep working with them to, to get them to that level. You know, there's there's two things tying with what Juan said. You know, I think AI and robotics, just from our experience, my experience, I should say, in the last two years, the number of projects I'm working on around AI and robotics has exponentially multiplied. So we're working with multiple uh, vendors, companies around robotic food kiosks, and we definitely see that technology is has come to a cost that's affordable. And you know, I, I see over the next five to ten years a whole lot of those units being deployed in the U.S. I know Canada, there's quite a few deployed there as well as well as Europe. And then the other thing, just working directly on AI. Uh, you know, that technology is is getting smarter a lot faster than people expected. And I think a lot of people don't realize how big voice technology is in the fast casual and the, in the QSR world when it comes to the phone. But I think it's moving to the drive through next. Those are the two big things that we're working on that we see uh, really growing in the next 10 years. Great answer. Thank you, Jay. Melanie, same question, please. I think uh, technology that allows for better uh, facility uh, sustainability, less waste, better labor models, great, greater flexibility in menu choices for the customer and alternatives. You know, if you are a vegan, if you're plant based, if you're, you know, heavy uh, carnivore, you have those choices and to be able to kind of filter that for basically all of those for a better total uh, customer experience. I think, you know, that's what we're all talking about is a better ultimate customer experience. I think uh, technology can really help that and pulling from other industries and shared experiences would be awesome. Great answer. Thank you, Melanie. And Rick, finally to you, how do we get this better ultimate customer experience? Melanie just mentioned there, how, how do you see the industry changing in this particular sector? Well, I mean, it's clear that the whole sector and industry is consolidating, right? So that's a mega trend. And, you know, the well-built alley acquisition is just another outward sign of that consolidation. But the food company is consolidating. So we just re recognize that the consolidation is occurring. The global chains are driving the growth. And that it's still technology that is converging and exponentially changing. I just summarize and say that, you know, um, high speed communication, 4G, 5G, cloud, pervasive use of computing on the uh, web, IoT sensor technology is going to give rise to more and more AI. See, that didn't exist before. Now AI and then augmented reality, whatever we call it, to assist people to make decisions. And then I think blockchain and blockchain will be mandated on fresh food by the end of the decade. So I, I think what we're going to see in our industry is our customers don't really want to own the equipment so much. They want what the equipment can do. So big question, uh, Michael, big technologies, but they're converging and they're exponentially changing. But we still have to use our brains to connect the dots into this change to make it happen in the industry. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Rick. That's a, a hopeful and, and a positive sentiment for us to close upon. This has been a, a really insightful and, and a fun discussion from a, a, a top draw panel. So Melanie, Bill, Juan, Jay and Rick, my thanks to you for joining us today. I'd also like to thank Wellbuilt for their continued support. Thank you for watching. Please stay tuned to fcsi.org for future events. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.